is only there for the administration of a foul, if a foul were to occur. And if HS says, we want this to be a team control foul, so we don't shoot free throws and the game speeds up. Greetings, everyone. I am so stoked. We're back in the studio with another episode of the Basketball Rules Expert YouTube show. The show where we take National Federation of High School Rules off of the printed page. We simplify, clarify, amplify, and give them back to you in a format you can take with you onto the basketball court where it's most important. Greetings again, everybody. My name is Greg Austin with a betterofficial.com. I've been a high school basketball official for over a decade, and I consider myself to be a basketball rules expert. This show is helping you on your journey to becoming a basketball rules expert as well. Before we get started on today's show, let's thank our show supporters. Brett Green, Wa Law, Alonzo Maxwell, and Quan Spears. Much appreciated and much love. So appreciative of all the supporters of our show. If you want to be a supporter of the show, there's a link in the show notes below. Today we're going to be focusing on a few play scenarios that focus on resumption of play and team control. It is absolutely critical that we understand team control in the game of basketball. When does team control start? When does team control end? How does team control start? And how does team control end? It's critical, fundamental, basic understanding that we have to have as basketball officials. All right, let's get started with our very first play scenario. A1 has the ball for a throw-in. The throw-in pass deflects off of A2. As A2 and B2 are attempting to retrieve the ball, a2 illegally pushes B2 from behind and is ruled for a foul. Team B is in the bonus. The officials rule that B2 is awarded bonus free throws. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? All right, let's start by looking at Rule 4, Section 12, Control, Player and Team. So we're looking at player control and team control. Article 1. A player is in control of the ball when he or she is holding or dribbling a live ball. That is something you must cement between your ears to have a firm grasp on the rules of high school basketball. Player control is established by a player holding or dribbling the basketball. Simple, straightforward. I own that. It's in my pocket. It goes out with me on the court every single time. A basic fundamental concept that's here in Rule 4, the most important rule for new basketball officials. And, I, and it's we're going to build upon that and have a firmer understanding of team control. Article 1 also says there is no player control when, during a jump ball, a jumper catches the ball prior to the ball touching the floor, or a non-jumper, or during an interrupted dribble, right? Which is an important concept. But the most important concept, a player is in control of the ball when he or she is holding or dribbling a live ball. Article 2, a team is in control of the ball. We have team control, A, when a player of the team is in control, a player of the team in control would mean that it is a player holding or dribbling the basketball. B, while a live ball is being passed among teammates. So we have player control, we pass the ball to another player. While the ball's in flight, we have team control, but no player control. And then when the player catches the pass, now we have player control again. During an interrupted dribble, we need to know the definition of an interrupted dribble. And D, when a player of the team has disposal of the ball for a throw-in. Okay? D was added within the last decade in an effort National Federation of High School wanted uh, fouls that occur during throw-ins 
to be team control fouls, no free throws being shot, and a chance to speed up the game. The introduction of this one clause, Article 2, D, when a player of the team has disposal of the ball for a throw-in, has caused a lot of confusion for high school basketball officials. There's no way around it. Since the introduction of this clause, NFHS has been scrambling, trying to uh, herd the kittens and get a better understanding of the rule. Hopefully we'll get that today. Article 3, team control continues until... Okay, so once team control is established, how is it established? By the, a player gaining control. Now we have, or a, a ball being handed uh, at the disposal of a thrower for a throw-in. Team control continues until A, the ball is in flight during a try or tap for goal. When a player releases a try, there is no longer team control by rule. B, an opponent secures control. How can opponents secure control? They can hold or dribble the basketball. Those are the requirements in order for a player to gain control. Or C, the ball becomes dead, a violation, a foul, etc. So, in our play scenario, A1 has the ball for a throw-in. When the ball is placed at the disposal of the thrower, there is team control, okay? But understand this, the team control that is given during a throw-in is only there for the administration of a foul, if a foul were to occur. And if HS says, we want this to be a team control foul, so we don't shoot free throws and the game speeds up, right? It does not apply to whether or not a backcourt violation occurs. We, in order to do that, we need team control on the court. It doesn't apply two, three seconds in the lane area. In order to have that, we need team control in the front court. Okay, so team control only for the administration of fouls. In our play, A1 throws a throw in pass to A2, hits off their hand, and is loose on the floor. B2 and A2 are both attempting to go get the ball. A2 pushes B2, and a foul is ruled. Team B is in the bonus. But in this instance, since there was team control for the administration of fouls, they, we will not shoot bonus free throws. So, were the officials correct? In this case, the answer was no. All right, let's move on to our next play scenario. After A1's try is released and is in flight, the official inadvertently blows their whistle. The ball hits the ring, but the try is unsuccessful. The possession arrow is pointed towards Team B. The officials rule that an alternating possession throw-in will be awarded to Team B on the end line. Were the officials correct? Yes or no. A1 releases a try. The official has an inadvertent whistle. Maybe they thought there was an issue with the clock. Maybe they thought there was a timeout request. For whatever reason, the whistle is sounded, the ball is in flight. The ball hits the ring, but the try is unsuccessful. The ball is now dead. The ball did not become dead on the official's whistle because the try was in flight. The ball was still live. The clock should be stopped. Ball is still live until the try has ended. So we know that team control has ended because A1 released a try. When a try is released, there is no longer team control, right? How does team control end? By a try, by the opponent gaining control, player control, holding or dribbling the basketball, or the ball becomes dead. So in this instance, team control ended when the try was in flight. In this situation, when we have a dead ball, we need to go to the possession arrow to determine who will have the resulting throw in. In this instance, the possession arrow is pointing to team B. Simple, the team, team B will get the throw in on the end line. Let's quickly check rule four, 36. If we look at article one, method of resuming, a point of interruption is a method of resuming play 
due to an official's inadvertent whistle, an interrupted game, as in 5-4-3, a correctable error, as in 2-10-6, a double personal, double technical, or simultaneous foul, right? So we have, a, we have an inadvertent whistle. Um, an interrupted game might be a small child runs onto the floor and the officials stop the game. Um, a correctable error will have a, a full and extensive uh, master class on that in an upcoming episode. Uh, any double, pow- double foul, double technical foul, simultaneous foul, we would go to the point of interruption. A play must be resumed by one of the following methods and C, a jump ball or alternating possession throw in when neither team is in control and no goal in fraction nor end of quarter extra period is involved when the game is interrupted. So the game wasn't stopped because of a foul or a violation. So there's no infraction. There's no goal because the ball didn't go in the basket and it's not the end of a period, right? So in this situation, how are we going to start the game? We're going to go to point of interruption. Point of interruption will be where did, when did the try end? The try ended when the ball contacted the ring and missed. So at the spot nearest to where the, the try ended, we're going to have an alternating possession throw in and get our game moving. All right, next play scenario. A1's legal throw-in is bouncing untouched in Team A's backcourt. An official improperly whistles a timeout for Team B. Is that timeout request granted? The officials rule that Team B is granted the timeout and must take the timeout. Play will resume with a Team A throw-in at the spot of the original throw-in. Were the officials correct? Yes or no? Let's break down this play. It's a great play, right? It just forces us to know the correct rules. Now, if we didn't know the correct rules, we can use common sense and go from there. Common sense, though, is often a bastion for when we don't know the rules. So let's learn the rules here and take them with us onto the basketball court. All right, so a throw-in pass is released and it is bouncing untouched in the backcourt. The official hears a timeout request, turns, grants the timeout, then realizes that they have granted it to the team that was not in control. Do we allow this timeout? In this instance, we're going to have to look to a case play. Case plays from the National Federation of High School bring up scenarios that aren't necessarily found in the rules. And they say, if this happens, this is how we proceed, right? It's filler in between the rules and case play carries as much weight as the actual rules themselves. Let's look at National Federation of High School case play 5.8.3 situation E. A1 is dribbling the ball in her back, his or her backcourt when team B head coach requests and is erroneously granted a timeout by the official. That sounds like our play. Or B, the team A head coach is yelling, side out, side out, something we often hear as basketball officials and can be confusing. The official hears side out, turns and grants the timeout. The coach didn't want the timeout. So those are our two scenarios. The ruling in our play, in A, Team B is entitled to use the timeout since it was requested and granted. Even though they should not have been granted, the official did grant the timeout request. And as a result, they once granted, it cannot be revoked and is charged to Team B. All privileges and rights permitted during a charge timeout are available to both teams. Play will resume with a Team A throw-in nearest to where the play was stopped. Let's also look at at play scenario B, an inadvertent whistle has occurred, right? This is not saying, this this is describing this scenario. The coach says, five out, five out, right? Official turns, grants the timeout. Coach didn't request the timeout. This is an inadvertent whistle. In this case, the coach was not requesting a timeout and therefore should not be granted or charged with one. Play is resumed at the point of interruption. Actually, both of these plays are going to be resumed at the point of interruption 
what is the point of interruption? We need to know. We had a throw in. It was released by the thrower and is bouncing untouched on the court. The whistle sounds. The ball becomes dead. Where is the resulting play? Is it near where the ball was when the ball is dead? Right? Our point of interruption was a throw in by Team A. Has Team A completed the throw in? When does a throw in end? We have to know that. A throw in ends when it is touched legally by any player in bounds. Right? Was this ball touched by any player in bounds? Neither offense nor defense touched it. The throw in has not ended. Our point of interruption, therefore, is a throw in back at the original spot. So, in this instance, Team B officials rule that Team B is granted the timeout and must take the timeout, and that is true. Play will resume with a Team A throw in at the spot of the original throw in. Were the officials correct? In this instance, yes. Yes, they were. All right, let's look at our next play scenario. A3 is awarded a one and one bonus after being fouled. Team B is granted a timeout prior to the free throw administration. Upon return, the administering official incorrectly tells both teams two shots. A3 misses the first free throw and the ball is not rebounded. All players remain standing along the free throw lane lines motionless in anticipation of another free throw. The officials then realize their error. The officials rule that the ball will be awarded to the team with the arrow for an alternating possession throw in. All right, front end of a one and one, right? Player is fouled, it's bonus, one and one. Either coach requests a timeout, and the timeout is granted. The officials, remembering that it's not, a little, not time to take a break from the game, uh, communicate uh, that it's no, they didn't do that, right? And so we've got an opportunity for official to make a mistake. We didn't have good communication in the crew, obviously. Um, or there was confusion about whether it should be one-on-one. -on -one. But in any, event, in any event, when the players come out and we're going to resume play, the official would sound their whistle and uh, be begin administration of the free throws, right? In this instance, it should be one-on-one. -on -one, but in, the official erroneously says two throws. Bounce the ball to the player, shot misses, players anticipating, I mean, the ref said it was two free throws, uh, stand motionless, the ball drops to the floor. So what do we have? We have a dead ball. Whose ball is it? The player missed the front end of the one and one If we glance at Rule 6-4, alternating possession, Article 3, alternating possession throw-ins must be from the out-of-bounds spot nearest to where the ball was located. An alternating possession throw-in must result when, if we look at F, the point of interruption cannot be determined, as in 4-36-2-C. And that goes back to our good friend, a jump ball or alternating possession throw-in when neither team is in control and no goal, infraction, nor end of the quarter or extra period is involved when the game is interrupted. So the game has stopped. There's no team control and no indication of who should get the ball. So as a result, we will go to the alternating possession arrow for the resulting throw-in. The spot will be nearest to where the try ended. So it'll be an end line throw-in for the team with the arrow. So and back in our original scenario, the officials ruled that the ball will be awarded to the team with the arrow for an alternating possession throw in. Were the officials correct? In this instance, yes. Yes, they were. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today on Basketball Rules Expert, the YouTube show that's all about helping you become a better basketball referee. If this content is valuable to you, it's time now to do all the things. Like, subscribe, and notify. Also share the video content with other basketball officials who you think could gain value as well. If you want to be a supporter of the show, you can always buy us a coffee. There's a link above and in the show notes below. And as always, we'll have a quiz back at the website, abetterofficial.com. There'll be a link 
above and in the show notes below. All right, we have additional video content for you here. Choose wisely, and we'll see you in the very next video. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care.